I'm trying to get this TV to work. Did you try the rabbit ears? Oh, that's a good idea. I forgot. That's better. Hey, what channel does Guy Lombardo come on? I don't know how to tell you this, Pastor Fancy Pants, but you ain't going to get Guy Lombardo on that old relic. What channel is Dick Clark on? I can't believe I have to explain this to you yet once again. Just because you have an ancient TV doesn't mean you can summon up the past. Well, in that case, let me propose a toast. Here's yours, here's mine, to a happy new year. Say, you're not drinking the Kool-Aid. I know all about you ministers and Kool-Aid. I know what will cheer you up. Woo! Happy New Year! Woo! I think I'm going to turn in early. The Belfry is calling me. What? And miss the coming of the New Year? Say, what has you so depressed? If you must know, Pastor Big Shot, I'm mad at Phyllis. How come she gets a date on New Year's Eve and I have to stay home with the likes of you? Oh, none taken. Why don't you just call up one of your many ex-husbands to come around? <laughs> That's about the saddest idea I ever heard. I give up. I know what might work. Why don't you tell me one of your New Year's resolutions? You know what they say about resolutions. They go in one year and out the other. Well, please cheer up. I'm making your favorite fruit flies and sauerkraut. Mmm, that cheered me up. Hey, look, it's almost time. It's almost midnight. I better get ready. What are you doing? Well, I want to start the new year off on the right foot. That's not your right foot, Pastor Genius. Oh my, look at the time. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Merry Christmas! Thank you for being here. The first day of the Christmas week. My goodness, it's coming fast, isn't it? I'm going to invite a Brother Mike Thomas to the pulpit to open our service with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come to your house and worship you, Lord. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds for the message that has been prepared for us. We ask that you help us to sing out in beautiful praise to you. We ask all this in your, in our, your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, let's take our hymnals and turn to page number 193. <clears throat> oh, come all ye faithful, number 193. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exultation. Oh, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, oh, glory in the highest. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. O oh, Jesus, to thee he be your glory again. Word of the Father, now in 
flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Nice job. That was brilliant. That was very good. At this point, I'm going to have uh, Brother Mike Spina come to the pulpit to lead us in our unison reading, which comes from Luke chapter 2. Please stand and help us read this. Uh, uh, stand if you're comfortable and capable of standing. Brother Mike. Well, I'll read along with you. Okay. <laughs> and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Amen. You may be seated. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. When we left off last week, a virgin named Mary is told by an angel named Gabriel that she's going to give birth to the long-awaited Messiah. Her fiancé, Joseph, believing that she has been unfaithful to him, and who can blame him for thinking that, not only calls off the engagement, but he decides to put her away. That's very generous of him. I mean, he, uh, most men would have been so angry they would have let the chips fall where they may, but he actually agrees to send her away, I assume at his, his own expense. He must still very much love her, even though he feels that she has cheated on him. But then the angel of the Lord convinces Joseph of the truth. Mary has not been unfaithful. In fact, quite the reverse. She's been such a great woman of faith that the Lord is honoring her to be the blessed, by being the blessed mother of our Savior. So the usual nine months pass. The time has come for the Christ child to make his entrance into the world. And I'm sure Joseph plans uh, for the Mary to give birth in their hometown of Nazareth where the two honeymooners reside as husband and wife. That is his plan, but as I often say, if you want to make God laugh, make plans. Because there's an Old Testament prophecy, Micah 5.2 to be precise, that tells us that the Messiah will be born in the city of David, the place called Bethlehem. How is the Messiah going to be born in Bethlehem when his mother is ready to give birth and she's pregnant and residing in the city of Nazareth? How is this going to happen? How will God fix this geographical problem? Well, God does come up uh, with a strange way to solve this problem. And as they do say, God does work in mysterious ways. This brings us to our unison reading. The supreme ruler of the land at this time is a man named Caesar Augustus. And to fund his very expensive empire, Caesar Augustus declares that all of his subjects both Jewish and Gentile, will come and pay a tax. The trouble is the census has, in that city had not been taken since Cyrenius was governor of Syria a few decades earlier. And before at the time of Cyrenius, um, uh, before, uh, where, I lost my place. before the time of Cyrenius, Joseph's family had lived in Bethlehem, as most of the descendants of King David did. Bethlehem was known as the city of David. So because of Caesar's attempt to fix this out-of-date census, many relocated people, including Mary and Joseph, have to be counted and to pay their tax in Bethlehem, their town of origin, which is about 97 miles south of Nazareth. This seems incredibly inconvenient, doesn't it? Especially with Mary being so heavy with child. But nobody says no to Caesar Augustus. He doesn't care about this Jewish pregnant woman. He would slice off her head as soon as look at her. So Joseph, scared not to pay the tax or go to Bethlehem to be counted and wanting to be a good citizen, Joseph loads up his heavily pregnant wife and makes the trek to the family's hometown of Bethlehem to be counted and to pay their tax. 
This forces Mary and Joseph to relocate to Bethlehem in time for their son's birth. This will also fulfill the Old Testament prophecy. As I said before, God does work in mysterious ways. Let me stop here. You know, I'm a Bible teacher. That's all I am. I decided several years ago that when I'm in the pulpit, I will stay in my lane. Well, I'm going to swerve out of my lane a little bit this morning because I feel it's part of my job as a Bible teacher to clear up a misconception. In the last several years, a couple years now, I've heard well-meaning people, well-meaning people equate Mary and Joseph to illegal immigrants. This could not be further from the truth. They are from Nazareth, which is a city of Israel, and they're traveling to Bethlehem, which is another city in Israel. That would be much like the same as one of us traveling from here to Wheeling, West Virginia. It's all still the same country. It's all still America. And Mary and Joseph are making their journey to pay their tax because they're citizens, not immigrants, not illegal immigrants. Paying taxes is something illegal immigrants don't often do. In fact, I don't know that they would do, and why would they? they you know. Now, later on in our story, they do seek asylum in Egypt, but even then, they're not illegal immigrants. They're, they, they return to Nazareth immediately after it's safe to do so. They're only in Egypt temporarily. Now, my public correcting this misunderstanding should not be taken as a lack of sympathy for those who are trying to immigrate into our country. That's a discussion for another place and another time. I only speak of it because I've lately seen the Holy Family used as both pros and cons in, this, in America's argument against immigration. And I'm just telling you right now, it's not part of their, that agenda. It really isn't. And I'm here to say that their story simply does not apply to either side of that debate. Let me also correct another misconception. Joseph and Mary are not homeless. They have a home back in Nazareth. And when they decide to stay in Bethlehem a little bit, they reside in a house as well. That's when the wise men come to the house where they are living. Also, Mary and Joseph aren't penniless. They've traveled to Bethlehem to pay their tax. If they were penniless, they wouldn't be paying anything. Joseph is a carpenter. He's well employed. They have money. And again, I'm not trying to make light of the plight of the poor or the homeless. I'm merely saying that the story of Mary and Joseph does not fit that agenda as I've been told lately that it does. Anyway, that's being said. I hope I didn't make anybody mad at me, but I had to point that out. The couple, that being said, the couple does have a little misfortune, though. They do. When they arrive in Bethlehem, the inn is full, and Mary is about to have this child. That's really the only hard luck in the story so far, other than making, having to schlep all the way 97 miles to pay this tax. I mean, who wants to do that? And even that, the inn being full, happens under the providence of God and under his, his watchful eye. The Lord provides a stable for his son to be born in. Okay, let's leave Bethlehem proper. Let's go to the, visit the outskirts of Bethlehem. Shepherds who live near Bethlehem are out at night in, in, in their fields watching over their sheep. There's nothing unusual in this. This is just part of their job, their nightly routine. Shepherds stay with their defenseless sheep at night to, to fend off bigger animals who might want to hurt the lambs and, and robbers who might want to steal the sheep. This is just a normal night. Nothing unusual is expected. Shepherds taking turns, catching up on some sleep while the others take uh, patrol the, the, the flocks, the pastures. Uh, shepherds may be swapping stories maybe singing or whistling to make the night go a little faster, nothing out of the ordinary at all, and then suddenly there appears a bright light. This must have startled them greatly to have the dark sky suddenly just glow, to shine. But this isn't just any ordinary light. It isn't coming from the moon. It's certainly not coming from the sun, being that it's nighttime. This light isn't a reflection from their campfire. This isn't just any bright light. It is a pure light that probably none of us have ever seen because it is the glory of the Lord. I don't think any of us have ever seen a light so pure. The shepherds have never seen a light so bright. It is frightening. Then the angel of the Lord suddenly appears unto them. The shepherds grow even more afraid. You and I would be afraid too, not just because of the suddenness or the unusual nature of this event, but because we are all sinners. And our sin, just like that of the shepherds, makes us afraid when we come face to face with heavenly sinless glory or beings in glorious forms. We're just going to be afraid. And the angel says what they always say, fear not. 
They have to say that, or we will pee our pants. They have to say that. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Certainly the shepherds are a little more than intrigued. Then suddenly this angel, this single angel, is joined by others and others and others. And soon a multitude of angels appear and announce glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And just as suddenly as the angels had appeared, they, dis they disappear and the night sky grows dark once again. The shepherds are amazed and excited. They begin to discuss with each other, blah, 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 blah. You saw that, right? I didn't imagine that, did I? We weren't dreaming, were we? Did anyone else see this? I wonder. Does everyone know about this good news? Or are we shepherds the only ones privileged with this information? Well, I suppose there is another group who are witnesses to this happening. The sheep. <laughs> the sheep see this. And I wonder what the sheep were thinking. You know, sheep aren't sinful creatures like we are. Maybe they weren't afraid. Or maybe the light made them afraid, maybe they scattered, or maybe they were just too dumb to know what they had just witnessed, I don't know. In a weird way, the message of the angels is almost as important to the sheep as it is to the shepherds. I mean, for centuries, sheep were sacrificed uh, as, by the Jews as an atonement for their sins. But everything from that point is about to change. Behold, the Lamb of God is born. No more will lambs have to be unnecessarily sacrificed on behalf of sinners. This news of Christ's birth is a game changer, not just to us sinners, but also to the sheep. Anyway, after the shepherds gained some composure, they realized, oh, that just happened. They decide to go see this baby that the angels were talking about. I'm sure the shepherds felt privileged. Let's face it, this kind of thing doesn't happen to mere shepherd boys every day. There's an excitement. The shepherds are overjoyed. And with their herds in tow, by the way, is it herds or flocks? Flocks. What travels in packs? Cigarettes. Okay, let's go on. That is an old Bob Newhart joke, by the way. With their flocks in tow, they run as fast as they can and soon find Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. And the shepherds fall to their knees when they see Jesus and they are filled with joy that they had found their Lord. This is why Jesus had to be born in a stable, by the way. As the Lamb of God, Jesus needed to be among his own kind, other lambs. No doubt the innkeeper would not have allowed lambs in his inn, so God arranges for the end to be overbooked. So God arranges things so Jesus was born in a stable among his own kind, other lambs. Isn't God clever? He arranged all this so everything would fit prophecy and everything would be as it should be. Anyway, the shepherds worship the baby and they, then they return to their pastures glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. You know, this time of year people talk about catching the Christmas spirit. Well, if there's anyone who's ever actually caught the true Christmas spirit, it would be these shepherds. These lowly shepherds, in a way, become the first preachers and disciples of Jesus Christ. They made known what they had experienced and what they had learned, what they had seen to everyone they came in contact with. I picture they not only told everyone that day, they told everyone what they had witnessed that uh, for the rest of their lives. They're calling their grandchildren. Hey, Sonny. Hey, honey, come over here. I want to tell you about the, the night the angels came. I want to tell you about the time I saw the Lord Jesus in the manger. They probably told that story for the rest of their lives. The Bible tells us that others were drawn to believe the shepherd's story. You know, fishermen get a bad rap. Fishermen are told to tell some fish tales, some fish stories. Apparently, shepherds are known to, for their honesty uh, because the, everyone believes the shepherd's story. These shepherds must have been men of credibility. The Bible tells us that all those who heard the words of the shepherd wondered about these things that had come to pass. They didn't dismiss them. Oh, that's a foolish story. No, they wondered about them. They considered them. These shepherds were lowly, but they had wisdom. They understood the message of the angels and the wonders of the manger. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. Now the story of the shepherd teaches us that God goes to the lowly even in the nighttime. 
Although these shepherds were most likely poor, uneducated boys and men, but even these lowly shepherds can praise God and give testimony to his glory. The shepherds had a grasp and understanding of what had taken place. The Savior was born, for goodness sakes. They were honored to be allowed to be part of this blessed nativity story. These shepherds even had an effect on Mary, the Bible tells us. After the shepherds visited, the Bible tells us that Mary embraced the words of the shepherds and she continues to ponder them in her heart. Perhaps to some degree, the shepherds understood the events taking place maybe even more than Mary had. Perhaps just perhaps these shepherds caught the Christmas spirit before Mary did. I don't mean to insult Mary. She just, I mean, she just gave birth. She had other things on her mind. You know, Mary was astonished by Gabriel's words nine months earlier. Now, nine months later, she is equally as astonished as these shepherds came to pay tribute to her son. She knew that truly, truly her baby was special. Mary loved her son right from the beginning. From the time Gabriel announced his coming, Mary loved her son. But for the next few moments, let's, let's suppose this. Suppose Gabriel's message to Mary nine months earlier was a little different than the Bible tells us. Let's pretend. What if Gabriel had come to Mary and said, Mary, I'm going to give you a choice. You can choose to give birth to the Son of God and be blessed. You will always love him and he will always love you. But for the better part of the next 33 years of your life, being his mother will be difficult. Mary, you will constantly need to choke back your anxiety and fear as those who oppose your son plot against him. And in 33 years, you will stand helplessly as you watch your son die on a cross. Or, that's choice A, or choice B, you can just pass on the whole thing. And the Lord will just choose another woman to give birth to Jesus. In short, Mary, you can A, either be Jesus' mother for 33 years, but then he will need to die on the cross. Or you can choose not to be Jesus' mother at all, which do you choose. Now, I'm not told, I'm just pretending, I'm just talking hypothetically, but despite the trials that will lie ahead for young Mary, despite the agony of outliving her son, which no parent should do, despite the terrible ordeals that her son will have to endure, I believe Mary still would have chosen to be Jesus' mother, even if she had to give him up in 33 short years. She would rather have had Jesus than to have him, and have him taken away than to never have give birth to him at all. And I base that on what she says. We'll talk about this Christmas Eve, no doubt. The things she says when the angel Gabriel tells her that he is honoring her with this mission. Anyway, let's get back to our story. The angels did come to proclaim Christ's birth, but that's not the last time the angels come. Three days after his horrible crucifixion, the angels come to, at the, to the tomb to declare and proclaim his resurrection uh, from the grave. The angels proclaim that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, rose from the tomb. Today, this week, we celebrate his birth. And we should. We should. Which I am happy to do. I'm happy to teach on it. I'm happy to tell you about it. I'm happy to enjoy this time as we celebrate our Savior's birth. But it is actually his death and the resurrection that makes him our Savior. Jesus was born, Jesus died, and Jesus lives again. Thus, we can have faith in him. We can place our trust in him because we serve a risen Savior. Please take your hymnals and turn to page number uh, 175. While shepherds watch their flocks by night. Number 175. While shepherd, let's go. okay. Stop, 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 stop. Take two. At this point, I'm going to invite Mrs. Marshall. Marshall, okay. Take three. At this point, I'm going to invite Mrs. Marsha Kalp to the pulpit to give us her Advent reading and to have the candle lighting. As we prepare to light our fourth candle in our wreath, I felt it befitting to save this chrismon for last. Our final chrismon is 
Jesus in the manger. Luke 2, 7 reads, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. The definition of a manger is a box or trough in a stable or barn from which horses or cattle eat. Our Savior was not wrapped in a royal robe, nor laid in a gilted crib. He came to us a poor, lowly baby. Our fourth candle is the candle of love and revelation. God so loved us, he gave us his only son to lie in a feeding trough in a manger, humbling himself as only Jesus can do. The definition of revelation is revealing in a surprising way. What more of a surprise than the revealing of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, our Savior born in Bethlehem so long ago. Now, as we light the four candles in the wreath, let us all remember our hope and expectation of this babe in a manger. Let us not forget to have faith and make preparations for the coming birth. Let us lift our voices in joy as we proclaim the miracle. Let us feel the love as the secret is revealed. And let us rejoice in the reason for the season. And now we will take our hymnals and turn to page number 175, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks by Night. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angel of the Lord came down, and glory shone around, and glory shone around. Fear not, said he, for mighty dread had ceased their troubled mind. Glad tidings of great joy I bring to you and all mankind. To you and all mankind. And the last verse. All glory be to God on high and to the earth be peace. Good will henceforth from heaven to men begin and never cease. Begin and never cease. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite Mrs. Linda Campbell to the pulpit to deliver and to lead us in our response of reading. It comes to us from Mark chapter 12. Please stand if you're able and comfortable standing. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Amen, and you may be seated. Three weeks ago, we began our Christmas journey, and we talked about hope, H-O-P-E. Holding on to prayer's expectations. Hope begins when we say amen. Hope is trusting that our prayers have been heard. Hope is resting after our prayers have been answered. Hope, hope is, and hope is knowing that one way or another the Lord is going to make everything okay. The following week we talked about peace. P 
P-E-A-C-E, perfect existence at Christ's expense. In order for us to find peace, in order for us to be reconciled with God, in order for us to go to heaven, in order for us to have perfect peace, perfect existence, Jesus Christ needed to be sacrificed. Jesus Christ paid the price so that we could all have peace. Last week we talked about joy, J-O-Y, jumping overcomes you. When this old world fails us, when we are rejected, shunned, and mocked, and hated just because we're Christians, we have the joy of heaven to come. Jesus himself tells us to concentrate on the wonderful world to come instead of this old wicked world we leave behind. If we do, then we will leap for joy. This week we're going to talk about love, L-O-V-E. L-O-V-E stands for Lord of Victory Everlasting. You know, it's part of our culture to believe that in the whole universe, there's nothing greater than love. From the top 40 songs in our radio, to sonnets on, in our poetry books, to even sacred hymns in our hymnals, we are taught that love lifts us up, love conquers all, and all we need is love. But is this true? Is it true that love is the strongest force in the universe, or is this just trite propaganda used to used by the prose of poets and the lyrics of songwriters and sermons of silly village pastors. I mean, think about it. There seemingly is, are other powers in the universe that seem awfully strong and maybe even more mighty than love. Death, for instance. Death is a mighty thing, is it not? No matter how much we love others, we cannot prevent their deaths. Even though we're armed with an endless supply of love for an ailing individual, even though we have prayed for them, and all our love seemingly is not enough. In the end, death takes them because our love, all our love, every bit of our love, is not enough to save them. Sin. Sin is another awfully powerful factor in this universe. Is sin more powerful than love? Likewise, no matter how much we love an individual, we just can't save them from their sins. Even though our hearts break for them, even though we wish better for them, we simply cannot take their sins away. But I'm here to tell you, despite how it may seem, love is the strongest force in the universe. Love is more powerful than death. Love is, love is mightier than sin. We might well ask, well, what kind of love am I talking about? Well, I'm not talk, just talking about any sort of love. I'm talking about God's love. Only God's love is stronger than death and sin. Romans 5.8 tells us, But God commanded his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Not only are our sins conquered through the love of God, but so are our deaths. God sent his Son to pay for our sins, God sent his son to die in our places. He did all this because he loves us. Because God loved me, I am no long, I, there's no longer a need for me to pay for my own sins. His son picked up the tab. Because God loved me, I will have eternal life in heaven after my earthly death. His son died in my stead. Do we see love in the Christmas story? Well, certainly we do. We see the unborn John the Baptist's love for his unborn cousin Jesus. We see Joseph's love for Mary. We see Mary's love for their newborn son. We see love throughout the entire nativity story. But the love that steals all the attention away from all the others is the love of God. The theme of this whole story from start to finish, from Gabriel's first visit to the Holy Family as escape to Egypt, is God's love. God loved us so much, so much so that he did not want us to suffer in hell. He did not want us to be separated from him for all eternity. He loved us so much that he allowed his only begotten son to be born in the lowliest of means so that he could be the savior of us all. Jesus Christ not only afforded us the victory over death and sin, he made it so that this victory was eternal. It is everlasting forever. It's like the old song says, there's victory in Jesus. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He is the Lord of victory everlasting. And ladies and gentlemen, that is love indeed. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you 
for the great love that you had afforded us by sending your son to die for us, to be born of this world, to be mocked, to be spat upon, to be beaten. Yet that was all because of the love, the great love that you had, that you did not want to see us suffer for our sins, that you made a way out for us from, uh, from hell, that we could go to heaven if we just believe and put our trust in your son to take our sins away. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to page number 195. Please stand if you're able. We will sing one verse, the first verse of number 195, Silent Night. forget our choir uh, special on seven at 7 p.m. on Thursday uh, Christmas Eve at 9 p.m. on Friday dear Heavenly Father we do thank you for this Christmas season as we leave this place may you see us to our to our next destinations may we just rejoice in the fact that we serve a risen Savior and Lord may we take this Christmas spirit with us throughout this week and for all the weeks to come in Jesus name we pray amen Thank you for coming. Merry Christmas. I hope to see you Thursday or Friday. You are dismissed.